a slightly longer episode with a slightly longer intro, and totally worth it. Hold on to your protons. It's time for another episode of The Modern Moron, where we change our initials MM to Miraculous Maduri. If you remember some time ago, I interviewed Achintia Maduri, who has a PhD in electrical engineering. His work involved independent solar grids that could be deployed to disaster victims. Well, in this show, we're going to talk to the block that he is a chip off of, as they say, his father, Dr. Somaya Zulu Maduri. He's a scientist as well and is part of a breakthrough in superconductors and superconductivity. What the heck is that? Don't ask me, but we're going to ask him to dumb it down or more on it down for us. To do their thing, superconductors need very high pressure and very low temperatures, minus 300 degrees almost, because they generate a lot of heat. Well, Dr. Zulu, as they call him, has been part of a team that has figured out how to do it at almost room temperature. And that is a very big breakthrough. How big? I can't put it into perspective, but we talk about Star Wars for a second, so that's big enough for me. I'll also include a link to a very short, straightforward article about his work. We also talk about Hinduism bringing up children in a household that embraces both science and religion as part of the same journey. And you're going to hear some words you don't normally hear on this program. Here's a few of them. Maybe you can use them on your daily crossword puzzles. Lanthanum. It's a chemical element, soft, white, silvery metal that tarnishes rapidly when exposed to air and is soft enough to be cut with a knife. It's used for flint and lighters and is used in the semiconductors in Dr. Zulu's experiments. Dynamo. It's not only a way to describe the senator's personality, but it's literally a generator for turning mechanical energy into electrical energy. Epistemology. (laughs) It's the branch of philosophy concerned with the theory of knowledge, of course. And Upanishads, their ancient Sanskrit texts that contain some of the central philosophical concepts and ideas of Hinduism, some of which are shared with religious traditions like Buddhism. See how much benefit you're getting from making the modern moron part of your day? It's Superconductors, Science, and Sanskrit on The Modern Moron. Why is it important generally for scientists to be able to communicate their findings in a way that is relevant to non-scientific people? Is it for grant purposes? I'm finding in the little work that I did with your son that you really need to be able to convey the message in non-scientific terms. Yeah, it's interesting. I'll, I'll, um, I'll put it in a different perspective. Uh, Great. One of the th- first things I realized when I came to the United States is that you have access to a number of Nobel laureates. And, you know, these are great people in science. And across the board, without exception, one of the most beautiful things I've known is that when you talk to a Nobel laureate, he or she is able to recast their scientific discoveries in such a way that everybody can understand. Right. And I think that in itself speaks volumes about your actual understanding of that science. Because, yes, there are nitty gritty details which, you know, we can all talk about. But if I am able to cast that scientific problem or that scientific discovery into a language which everybody understands and appreciates, it means that I have understood the problem myself very, very well. And I think that's pretty much what I was always trying to do. And, you know, I remember uh, dinner time discussions uh, when we would speak to our children. My wife and I are both physicists and we would try to. And of course, we had, she's a theoretical physicist. I'm an experimental physicist, so we don't speak the same language. But, you know, we always try to dilute uh, the whole scientific picture into a manageable picture which you can visualize. I mean, the beauty of understanding science is that you can visualize, you can compare it, you can make it connect to something in the in the nature around you. And, and that's what we try to do always. And I think it has reinforced my view all the time that, you know, that's the way to go. That's really the best part of doing science, being able to share your enthusiasm to one and all. I'd like to go to the article that, that your son, Achintia, sent. And it came out in January. And now we're here... Uh, heading into mid-May, I feel like things probably haven't changed much since then, or or have they? No, no, they haven't. In regard to your superconductivity at room temperature uh, experiments. Yeah, they haven't. They really haven't. I mean, it's uh, it's, a, it was a- It takes a long time to get a development, right? Yes. Things don't just happen at a breakneck pace. No, no. In the laboratory. 
In fact, this is a question everybody asks me, and then um, you know, because this is not the first interview I've had about this particular discovery. And I, you know, I keep telling them that it's it's not something which happened in a day or two. You know, it's a, it's about I would say it's about a culmination of about twenty years of work which we have put in. But you know, it's not the end. It's just one more step going forward. But it's a huge step. I'd like to read for for the people listening uh, one of the paragraphs is. Superconductivity is the lack of electrical resistance and is observed in many materials when they are cooled below a critical temperature. And for a dummy like me, that's the the temperature at which a gas can be turned into a liquid by using pressure. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Generally. Yeah, yeah, generally. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Until now, superconducting materials were thought to have to cool to very low temperatures down to 292 degrees Fahrenheit, which limited their application. Since electrical resistance makes a system inefficient, eliminating some of this resistance by utilizing room temperature superconductors would allow for more energy efficient generation and use of electricity, enhanced energy transmission around the world, and more powerful computing systems. That last one, pow- more powerful computing systems, is that, is that kind of the big deal that this discovery could provide? Uh, yes. Okay. So, so let me step back and, you know, not, not uh, give you, the, sure. give you the not so gilded picture about it. <laughs> uh, yes. Room temperature superconductivity is the holy grail. Everybody wants it. You know, it's the, it's what science fiction is all made about. You know, you have these, uh, I'll give you a, an example of what it means. Any science fiction shows you these, uh, objects flying about right and uh, with practically no power in them and they're they're just coasting around now imagine we're talking like for example like a spaceship exactly or are you talking about microscopic no spaceships or you know even, okay. even those star wars kind of uh, great okay. okay okay let's ask ourselves how this could work you know there's a very simple way i could think that they could work and you know it comes from superconductivity let's say you have something which is superconductive it means that if you put a small piece of current into it, then it just keeps going round and round that object all the time. Now, if it is going to go round and round in a coil, then it's going to set up a magnetic field. That's known. I mean, this is the smallest thing we all understand about dynamos. If that magnetic field is repelling the Earth's magnetic field, then you're levitating something with absolutely no work by simple virtue of the fact that this is levitating by repelling the Earth's magnetic field. And now imagine that you just touch it, it just goes floating like, uh, you know, one of those air billiard balls or whatever uh, you have. Yeah. So it's defying gravity without generating heat or using energy. Exactly. Wow. So this is how, as a physicist, I would say, is what a magic carpet is all about. This is how, as a physicist, you know, <laughs> I would visualize those, those things which just fly around. But uh, the, the problem is that if they should, then they should be superconducting at room temperature. But then they also must be superconducting at room pressure. Right. Okay. Now that's where the whole thing comes apart because we are able to make it superconduct very close to room temperature, but we are able to make them superconduct at a pressure of approximately one and a half million atmospheres. Wow. Okay. Now, why does that, why do we need to do that? We need to apply so much of a pressure to get the atoms to, you know, be at the right positions so that if superconductivity comes together, it comes together at temperatures close to room temperature. Now, what does it mean? It means that, well, if I want to make this a technology which everybody is able to use, I have to figure out how to lower that pressure to room temp room pressure or you know do something some magic about it but you know it's it's all a small step in the direction and and i think in terms of this is in terms of technology in terms of using it in terms of you know where it's going to mm-hmm. make uh, a big difference to mankind practical application exactly but uh, in terms of the physics of it i think it's mind boggling because we were, you know, when we all went to school, we learned that superconductivity is because uh, things freeze or, uh, you know, in a way, the electrons are all kind of freezing into some state uh, where they don't want to have resistance. So that's why they superconduct. And you know, in a very simple way, you can think of it as almost all the electrons in your uh, piece of metal have coalesced into a single state. So they're all touching each other. 
So when you pass current, you know, you touch the, out, the electron on one side, instantaneously that current is transmitted to the electron on the other side because they're all sitting like an army, you know, next to each other. So that's, that's the picture of superconductivity we all had. And that kind of meant that temperatures had to be really, really low because, you know, as you keep increasing the temperatures, things get agitated. We know that. And, you know, things are not going to interact with each other so orderly. So the physics of it is amazing. And that's pretty much uh, what makes the, the exciting uh, discovery really exciting because uh, suddenly everybody is going to rethink about what is actually happening in this. So in a perfect world where you could have superconductivity at room temperature and at room pressure, mm -hmm. would the potential for space travel be enhanced? I guess I can't wrap my brain around what that means. Yes. I mean, it's not space travel per se, because when you go out into outer space, there are other forces which come into play. But moving around Earth, for example, you know, I mean, you, we've all seen Star Wars and, you know, we've always marveled at the at the beauty of things flying around in, in this. Right. Yeah. Everybody can relate to that because they can see it at the movies. Yes. And, and, and they expect you to make that happen. Yes. <laughs> and one way we can make it happen is if we can have something which is superconducting at room temperature and at room pressure. Simple. And what else can happen is that you can have electric lines which are transmitting with no losses. So, you know, you, you, you really don't heat up things and uh, you can have a lot of energy. But the other thing which, you know, you were talking about right at the beginning is that, okay, imagine now you have these computers and they're computing at very high speeds. One of the problems you have with computers computing at high speeds is that the electrons or the information is flowing back and forth at very high speeds, and that causes resistance, that causes heating. Generates heat. Right. So you've, you've heard of machines, you know, the supercomputers cooled by liquid nitrogen to keep them working. Right, right. If you have a, a, a data center, for example, yeah. one of the highest costs of operating at a data center is the air conditioning. Yes. So if you have something which is superconducting at room temperature and room pressure, then you don't have this problem. Right. So when, when something is superconducting, there is a little bit of quantum mechanics which comes into play. So I would say little. I mean, there's a lot of quantum mechanics which comes into play. That means that, you know, all this conceptual thinking we are having about quantum computers and come into play. So if I have a room temperature, room pressure superconductor, a lot of these dreams come to reality. That's how I would put it. So a superconductor that is high, high speed, uh, generating high speeds without generating heat, that can be translated to different types of motors, for example, or engines that could propel things? Yes, yes. I mean, so you could think of trains which are levitating and moving at high speeds. You could think of, you know, magnets which have amazing amount of magnetic power. So your uh, MRI machines or all these machines would have a totally different uh, uh, different, you know, scale of things available for you. So that's, that, that's, that's what it mm -hmm. is. And one of the keys to this, tell me if I'm wrong, is uh, from reading this article is it says the key to this discovery was a creation of a metallic hydrogen rich compound. One of the elements being lanthanum, which is kind of obsolete now used to make what we would remember as old cigarette lighters, the, the flint from a, a cigarette lighter, correct? Right. Yeah. Now, that's not compared to silicon. Silicon is very um, abundant that I'm, uh, from what my <laughs> tiny research, whereas lanthanum is not quite so prevalent. Is right. that correct? Will that be a cost factor because it's not so prevalent? Yeah, it certainly would be. So this would be the path forward. I'm taking something which is like lanthanum, and hydrogen and combining them and at about a 170 million atmospheres i make this compound which is superconducting at room temperature but it's at 170 million atmospheres let's say i come out with some innovative way of releasing that pressure and maintaining that material then i have a superconductor which is superconducting close to room temperature and Mm -hmm. at atmospheric pressure. So that would be the game, okay? Right. But why did we choose lanthanum? That was because, you know, there were a bunch of theoretical people who were predicting and uh, kind of looking at the interaction of different metals and uh, hydrogen, which would give us this kind of a configuration, which would superconduct at high temperatures. And lanthanum turned out to be the one which worked. I mean, we, we've tried calcium, we've tried, we've tried 
a lot of other metals. Mm-hmm. Okay, we've tried calcium, we've tried yttrium, we've tried uh, and so many, uh, selenium, sulfur, and so on. Anyway, but the lanthanum worked. Now, the game going forward would be, yes, we have to find a way, even with lanthanum, of retrieving this at room temperature pressure conditions so that you know we have something which we can work with at uh, our ambient conditions. And then the game would be to replace this lanthanum with something which is uh, probably cheaper or something more attractive to use to be able to make a new material. So it's it's a very long road going forward, but you know this is one way of going there. So this lanthanum isn't necessarily the linchpin. You might be able to find a different element that could be used in place of that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or I sort of, my science fiction mind pictures um, us finding out that there are mass quantities of lanthanum on the moon, and then there's a huge race to the moon to mine <laughs> lanthanum to create these superconductors. Something's going to be, I don't know, do, do we know exactly what what ores and elements are on the moon? Uh, I mean, I mean, so if you, if you go back to the, 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 the astrophysical ideas with which planet formations have occurred, then the heavier the metal, like lanthanum is a heavy metal, the bigger the planet should be. So it won't be moon, but, you know, it could be something out there, maybe not in this solar system, but somewhere else, a planet which is uh, bigger than the Earth and uh, somehow managed to get a lot more lanthanum than Earth did. So, yeah, right. So you know. so you're saying lanthanum is a very heavy metal and if you were to find large quantities of it it would have to, uh, the planet would have to be a quite large a massive planet. Yes, it has to be a massive planet because in the formation you you know that it's everything is forming from either cometary collisions with the planet or the planet accreting or coming together from the dust cloud, you know, in the, in the, in the origin of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So it, it's related to that. And, uh, and that's part of the game, you know, that's trying to understand uh, where we can get lanthanum. But, you know, like I said, maybe we can mimic lanthanum with something else. And, wow, and, that's uh, fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> did you grow up in India? Yes, I did. And did you attend college in India or did you come over here to, uh, for college and university work? No, I, I did all my college in India, everything, all my schooling. Okay. What was your childhood like? And what, what did your parents do? Because when I talked to Achintia, uh, we started talking about a religion a little bit. And then he said, well, my parents were both scientists. So there was a little bit of a like-mindedness there. Were your parents scientists as well? My father was a scientist. Oh, he was? Yes. He was. So Achintia is a third-generation scientist or more? He is a fourth generation scientist. A fourth, <laughs> fourth generation. I was listening to the interview that I did with Achintya, and when we were talking about the Hindu religion, and uh, we were talking a little bit about some of the rituals of the religion and how maybe your perspective on them change as you get older. Do did, did you recall uh, some of that conversation I had with your son? And what did that spark in your mind when you were a young man, his age as a scientist? Do you recall any of that conversation? Yes, yes, I do. It's funny because I, as a scientist and at Achintya's age, had pretty much the same outlook as Achintya has at his <laughs> age now. And, and that probably translated to my father's uh, outlook and his father's outlook. And uh, but at the same time, as we grew older, we realized that there isn't anything which is uh, disconsonant between the religion we follow and the science we have. So in that sense, you know, we never had a problem bridging the two. Right. Maybe this is sort of the general path of a scientist is to sort of question the faith and the religion and leave it for a bit only to find yourself to come back to it in some way. Yeah, and I think, you know, there is, there is uh, and this was something which I, when I heard Achintya's podcast, incidentally, it was a very good podcast. So I, I, I heard it a couple of times and then, you know, I got into a conversation with him. One of the things I think, you know, which makes it easy for a Hindu to be able to come to terms with his religious beliefs and the scientific work he or she does or the general work they do is that the Hindu religion is 
quite free about how you pursue your life or how what you do you know mm-hmm. it, there are no strict rules laid down it's something which you accept the rules i mean as you kind of understand how they link up with life and how they link up with your everyday activity the, the rules which are prevalent in india may not be useful to the united states but that's fine you know there is nothing telling me that i have to really do that and i think in a certain way you know i at least that's that's the way we were taught to religion in our house mm-hmm. and achintya start and my father was taught and so on and i think we all uh, kind of propelled it along we take the best out of the religion in terms of how we make our social contract and uh, live our own lives without uh, bothering about the rituals which are prescribed by the religion which may not have relevance to what we do i talked to him about why am i doing these rituals why am i and and we got into a, a bit of a discussion that the purpose of the rituals is not that they have a value in and of themselves in the moment but they're to remind us of things continually and we come back to those things to reground us to the basic principles of any religion yeah and i think that was kind of philosophy which was given to me by my father and the kind of philosophy which my wife and i prescribed to achintya and our children mm-hmm. that yes i mean we follow certain rituals but that is only because that gives us our discipline in terms of what we are uh, trying to be but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only way follow your path whichever way you want so the hindu religion has a philosophical approach that has sort of a many paths yes to enlightenment or to salvation or yes whatever you're looking for in life yes it does i i cannot profess to be a very deep thinker in terms of hindu thought because i'm only learning now you know in fact it's so interesting that after having come to the united states and after lived here so many years i found a guru here who 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 is kind of teaching me some of these things and it's it's very interesting because the guru has an interest in physics so we you know we, we every discussion we have is going to come down to the physics of things and how physics says this and how how the upanishads say this or what the religion says now what i must try to emphasize and which i have realized only of late is that the rituals don't necessarily a form a part of the hindu thought the rituals are something which have been prescribed and uh, you know over the ages they have modified they have changed and uh, people have the liberty to follow not follow but the knowledge of hindu thought is completely different and it can you can be anyone you want to learn the hindu thinking hindu philosophy Are you on a, a new journey so to speak or entered a sort of a different reinvestment in your religion by finding this new guru that you're having philosophical discussions with? Yes, in fact it is uh, it's been a great ride, you know, in the last uh, 10 years probably when I've kind of coalesced into this group which is able to discuss the I would put it in a very different way. I would say they're interested in the epistemology of the religion and and uh, there is there is comparison with other religions there is comparison with philosophy and trying to understand why we've uh, arrived at what we have and how it reconciles with what is there in the Upanishads for example which are the oldest uh, writings of Hindu philosophy. But the way I look at it is that uh you know pers- this is a personal speaking you know and this is uh, the way i look at it how long have you been studying with or working with this guru uh i would say the last uh 10 years i love th- i think because when i you said i found a new guru i was thinking oh a few months a couple a year or so but to a scientist like this culture in america is so give me satisfaction right now yeah. I want stimulation, I want results right now. I I want to I've got my phone in my hand and I want I want results right now. Whereas when you're a scientist, it's a lifetime you maybe have one great discovery that is your life's work. I guess my point is patience to a scientist and patience to an average American citizen are very different things. <laughs> Yeah and I think that's probably where the connection is between science and religion that one teaches you that uh, discovery of anything requires patience and the application of knowledge they say the definition of craziness is trying to do the same thing expecting a different outcome <laughs> yeah. but a scientist doesn't do the same thing over and over again they change one degree of 
of change, another degree of change and try it again, another degree of change. And that equals, you know, 10, 20, 30 years of work. That kind of patience is something I think that is lacking in the culture in this country today. In a certain extent, I think that is that is true for any country. In, in, it is true for even India. Really? You know, I mean, that's true. I mean, because the way I look at it now, when I go back to India and I, and I look at people around me, is that they want instant gratification. We all do, and, I guess. It's global, huh? Yes. And instant gratification, you know, is very interesting. You can get instant gratification if you follow a certain ritual, right? Because then what happens is at the end of the ritual, you have finished your contract with God. You know, that's it. So you're going to be taken care of because you have performed a certain ritual. Now, that's not the way philosophy goes. I mean, more and more I learn Hindu philosophy, the more I realize is that rituals are not a part of philosophy. Philosophy is completely different. Philosophy is trying to attempt answering deeper questions, which, are, which transcend all religions, which transcend all societies. At one level, they could look like very, very general questions. But at the same time, when you try to find answers to that and, you know, you try to understand what is your position with respect to the rest of the nature or the rest of the cosmos around you, you start feeling a certain connectivity. Mm -hmm. And that is what science is. I think that is my discovery in the last 10 years. And it, it's so it's so nice to have a guru who likes physics. So, you know, every, every small piece of thing we look at, you know, we, we try to understand it oh, you know, maybe this is what they meant, or maybe this is what it means. And so you're both learning from each other. Exactly. That's some, some great conversations, I would imagine. Yes, it has been amazing conversations. With them. Can we talk for a moment about your, um, professionally, you're about to embark on something new uh, this coming week? Yeah. Can, can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. What is it that you're going to be doing, uh, launching into, and what excites you about it? So uh, let me give a little bit of a perspective. Sure. This kind of work, this kind of work which I do, which is related to extreme conditions of pressures and temperatures, requires very sophisticated experiments. You know, very much like the particle accelerators are required to generate uh, this intense beam of X-rays with which you can understand what is going on at these pressures and temperatures. Mm -hmm. Turns out, that it turns out that there are very few places in the world where you can do these kind of experiments. So what happens is uh, that you're looking at samples which are at uh, pressures of millions of atmospheres and thousands of degrees Kelvin. And, and that means that uh, the sample sizes are extremely small. And so therefore you need to have very intense beam of X-rays to probe the samples. And uh, that is possible if I can say it is possible at four or five places in the world. That have the equipment and the investment into uh, the, what's needed to conduct the experiments? Right. So these are called synchrotrons, you know. And uh, the one, the most powerful one in the United States is the uh, advanced photon source, which is in Chicago. Now, it turned out that, you know, I have been one of the people lucky enough to be associated with the development of the experimental techniques from 1994. You know, the first time when I came to the United States, that was my, that was my calling, you know, that was what I was asked to do. And that was why I came back. So I started working on that and I actually built a beam line out of a bunch of experimental stations in uh, uh, Chicago in APS, and then came to uh, Washington DC to work here for a few years. It turns out that they're looking for a group leader and so I interviewed for that. So I'm actually going back to where I belong, you know. I'm going back to running that show there, and, and, <laughs> I, and I look forward to it. So are and, you going to be moving uh, to Chicago? Yes, yes. Really? I, wow, yeah. congratulations. Thank you. It's going to be a big change from what you've been doing? No, not really. I, you know, Achintya, is, uh, when, when Achintya was going to school, I was commuting between here and Chicago. So now I'm going to... <laughs> That's a long commute. Yeah, exactly. It was. <laughs> you need a superconductor for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here all week. <laughs> well, you'll be a little closer to the West Coast being in Chicago. 
Yeah. And you also have access to some equipment that will allow you to do your work more thoroughly or in a better environment? Yes, I think both the things. I mean, firstly, I mean, in terms of the family connectivity, yes, I, I will be in the Midwest, so I'm closer to San Francisco. So that is great. And my daughter, incidentally, is going to be moving to Seattle in this fall. So, you know, it's fine. Your daughter is? Yeah. Is she a scientist as well? Uh, she's an engineer like Achintya, and she's going to go to grad school now. <laughs> Really? Yeah. What is her, uh, what type of engineering does she study? So she did electrical engineering and, uh, and unlike Achintya, has gotten interested in uh, neuroengineering. She wants to develop instruments or uh, she wants to develop uh, uh, devices which will uh, help uh, neurological uh, issues. And uh, so she's with a startup in San Francisco right now. And she decided that she wants to go into neuroengineering, and that's how she's going to Seattle. She's going to. How old were your kids when you moved to the United States? My daughter was, uh, I presume, two, and Achintya was probably eight, uh, let's see, nine. Yeah. It's funny, you're the third scientist that I've interviewed, and 100% their parents were scientists as well. Your grandfather was a scientist, is that correct? Right, was. Achintya's grandfather from both sides, you know, from his mother's side and great-grandfather from his mother's side and his father's side were both scientists. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the people, the generation above them were scientists. It turned out that I think in both cases, these were people who were exposed to the British, the Western thought. Mm -hmm. And they realized that there is an advantage in trying to, you know, learn English and get schooled and go into doing uh, science in both cases. I guess my point here is to be a scientist to me is almost like saying, I want to be a baseball player. Mm -hmm. I want to be a scientist. Like we think, no, that, that's not. What does science contribute to the gross national product? Are we cranking out widgets? Are we making textiles? Are we building houses? Is that if you're going to be a scientist, that's really dreaming big. Mm -hmm. And to get out of the mentality of, I've got to learn a trade. No, I'm not going to learn a trade. I'm going to dream big and I'm going to be a scientist or I'm going to be an astronaut or whatever that is. And I'm wondering what it was in your family that shipped the paradigm? I think it was uh, both the, you know, if I go back, I mean, it's a very, very, very relevant question you're asking. And it's something, you know, I'm thinking on the fly as I'm talking to you. And if I understand uh, the family histories of both uh, Achintya's mother and my families, I would say the generation before the people who became, who took to science were still knowledge seekers. Ah, uh, Yes. And I can see both the great great grandparents there, grandfathers there. I know were people who were delving into Hindu philosophy mm. in some small way, and uh, they were people who were learning. You know, though they were learning, let's say, in a totally Hindu environment. And now you bring into that environment the British, who have open schools where they teach English and they teach the Western thought. Mm -hmm. And I think in a certain extent, that quest for knowledge is what, and of course, the money associated with that learning of English language and the English customs, which would give them the exposure to being in the English uh, system, uh, mm -hmm. pushed them towards uh, reaching out for that. And both his great grandfathers excelled in, uh, in science. My grandfather was a botanist. He, in fact, uh, went to, he did his PhD in, the, in Madison, Wisconsin. Really? Yes. And then and, and Chintya's other grandfather, other great grandfather, or my wife's grandfather, actually went to Oxford. I find that so great and fascinating that this thirst for knowledge, a lot of people don't get the opportunity to pursue education and follow their curiosity. Right. And it's interesting that with the scientists that I have interviewed, it's part of the gene pool, you know? Right. It's generation after generation. It, it reminds me of a certain Hindu philosophical, one of the philosophical discussions I was having with my guru, and, and, and it comes from one of the ancient Vedas. One of the thing, one of the lines in that Veda is, there is no other way to salvation other than by knowledge. Mm. You know, that's, that's the way it is. So knowledge in any form is your only way to salvation. And salvation in terms of being a better human being, I would say. You know, let's mm -hmm. think of very sophisticated things. 
So that is probably what drives a lot of people. And I've enjoyed the journey, you know, and I've enjoyed the journey immensely because uh, in a way coming to the United States put me in touch with so many different people and, and so many brilliant scientists that the quest for knowledge is, was the, the central driving force. That's so great. It's interesting that, that you keep mentioning your guru, and, and I guess I'm trying to relate to it from a you know, growing up in this country and being primarily surrounded by uh, traditional Christian types of religions that, you know, you go to church every Sunday, there's a service, whereas with the Hindu religion, is there a regular day that you go to a service and whoever conducts that service, is that someone different from this guru that you're speaking of? And how is the relationship that you might have with the person that you go to your temple or wherever you go for an organized service, how is that different from the relationship that you have from your guru? It's a very deep question and it's, it's true. It's true. It's, and it's, it's, uh, it's different then. Yes, it is. A priest is different than a guru. Yes. And uh, a priest okay. doesn't necessarily do anything but conduct a ritual which makes you connect with the symbol of God on the other side of the fence. And, you know, if you don't feel liberated by that ritual, don't go to the temple. You know, I, I mm -hmm, don't, mm -hmm. I don't, in my childhood, I think at least my, my father was one who didn't really believe in all this. So he never encouraged us to go to temples. Right. But mm, interesting. Right. So we, we never, we never had that. We never uh, had that issue. And at the same time, my mother was religious, you know, she was devout and she would sit at home and, you know, pray. And But the only thing I do remember is that my father still told us about the Hindu mythology, you know, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana and so on and so on. And we just heard it as stories. That's it. We never made a connection between what was given in these myths to what is given in the Hindu philosophy at all. And we never felt lost about it. And, you know, I think the first time I ever made that contact was when I started discussing with my guru. And uh, it again, you know, when I said there is no compulsion, I don't have to go to this guru. But at the same time, you know, there is this connectivity in a quest for knowledge, which is driving us together and, and we are enjoying those discussions. And I think that's the thing that this is true for every Hindu, there is no necessity for him or her to go to a temple or mm -hmm. to do a prayer or do a ritual. It's very private. It's your religion. How does a Hindu go about finding a guru? And is the relationship with the guru that you have or to the traditional relationship with a guru, is it a one-on-one -on -one relationship or do you meet in a group to discuss with your guru? It turned out that I, I actually met this guru in a group. You know, a group of us, a group of people who would come together and and we were uh, actually at that time, the group was learning the Bhagavad Gita. So he would try his best because there were many people who, who spoke different languages. And if you put five Indians together, there would be four languages. So he tried to, you know, enlighten us in English and so on. And it then transcended to a point where, you know, I started going one on one. with, him. And that was how it just happened, because I think that's how it it really takes place. It's just the mutual meeting of two interests that, that brings together a guru. With, uh, and does your guru have, if someone is a guru, is that a title that one attains through some regimented method or path? Or is it just, is it literally just another word for a teacher? I think it's interesting that you asked that question because I, I once asked my guru exactly the same question. I said, how did you get to, <laughs> you know, how did you get to start teaching people? And he gave me a very interesting answer. He said, oh, you know, I was reading philosophy just purely out of my interest. I was, I was just reading it. And it turned out that there was some public function where some guru from India had come and was giving a talk. And somebody asked a question and this gentleman raised his hand and he said, no, you know, that's not true. This is what it says. And it seems he was called by that person and he said, you seem to be very knowledgeable. And he said, no, sir, you know, I've just read all this stuff. And he says, then why are you not sharing it with others? So that started his journey as a guru. You know, it was just somebody telling him, when you have acquired knowledge, you should share it with others because that's the only way you, 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 you introspect on what you are teaching. And I think that's, that's, a, that's how he became a guru. 
So within the the realm of being a guru, as it pertains to Hinduism, it's not like you take a test and you're a certified guru and here's your badge. No, I don't think so. Uh, you probably become a guru before you realize you become a guru. Yes. But then, you know, it's a very treacherous, uh, you know, it's a double-edged sword because, you know, you can, you can become a guru and lose humility and then you're not a guru anymore. <laughs> you know? Ah, that, that's a, that's a fine line, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's, it's hard to be a teacher and still be humble. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that I, you thought I was going to ask you or something that you wanted to talk about? No, not really. This, this conversation was uh, amazing because it was something I came with an open mind and you know, I enjoyed it. Well, there you go. I hope you enjoyed some parts of that conversation. I enjoyed the whole thing. One last thought on gurus and senseis and teachers in general of religion, spirituality, and philosophy. If a guru tells you that they are a great guru, you should probably walk away. If a guru tells you they're the best and most gifted guru, you might want to even run away. If someone tells you that they have much to learn before ever being considered a guru, that might be your guru. And as one of the greatest gurus to ever walk the earth, thank you for listening to The Modern Moron, and we'll see you next time.